Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our fourth Stop the Hate event discussing current challenges in fair housing. Before we get started, I'd like to run through a few housekeeping messages so you all know how to participate in today's event. Um, first, all lines are on mute. If you're interested in receiving CLE credits for today's program, please be sure to reply to the poll questions that will appear sporadically during the presentation. We will collect these and address them throughout the Q&A. Similar questions will be combined and inappropriate or offensive questions will not be announced. Due to time constraints, please keep all questions on topic. If you experience any technical difficulties at any point during our program, please uh, explain your problem through the chat feature and we will try our best to address the issue. Lastly, we are recording this meeting and the video will be available on our YouTube page within 24 hours. Please subscribe to New Jersey OAG and Civil Rights NJ on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Flickr for the latest updates on news, information, and resources from our office. And now I'd like to hand things off to our host and moderator for today, Aaron Scherzer, Chief of Strategic Initiatives and Enforcement for the New Jersey Division on Civil Rights. Aaron. Thank you so much, Whitney. Um, and thank you so much to everyone for, um, for joining us today for the final panel of our month-long celebration of the Law Against Discrimination. Um, we hope that you will join us tonight. Also, um, this is our final panel, but our final event is actually this evening, and Tisha will drop information about that um, into, the, into the chat. Um, but we're really excited about that as the, as the um, awards ceremony of our youth bias student competition is this evening. Um, so I wanna uh, thank everyone, uh, all the people who are attending the panel for coming. We have a really exciting lineup of advocates and government leaders here today to talk about fair housing. Uh, and thank you in advance to all of the fantastic panelists and speakers for joining us. As many of you know, April is Fair Housing Month. And so we wanted to use this panel to highlight the importance of the fight for fair housing and to discuss some current challenges in that fight. The fight for fair housing is not a new one. It has been going on since long before the LED was passed because of our country's long history of systemic housing discrimination. And we know that systemic inequalities, including systemic racism, create housing segregation and limit access to housing, and that those inequities have only been exacerbated and laid bare by the COVID-19 pandemic. Preventing discrimination, both systemic and interpersonal in housing, is critically important because access to housing affects not just the roof over our heads, but also access to education, healthcare, employment, and other opportunities. So we're excited to have this panel today to discuss those fair housing challenges and what can be done to address them. I wanna start by welcoming our opening speaker, Assistant Secretary Janine Warden, who is the Acting Assistant Secretary for Fair Housing and Equal Opportunity at the US Department of Housing and Urban Development. We're thrilled to have such fantastic partners at HUD whom we work with in a number of ways, and we're excited for all of you to hear more about some of the priorities of the new administration. Thank you so much to you, Assistant Secretary Warden, who has been um, a leader at HUD for, for many years, and uh, we're delighted that you're able to, to join us today to talk about HUD and your work and those new priorities for the Thank you very much for that kind introduction. So it's my pleasure to be here to help celebrate the 75th anniversary of the Law Against Discrimination and to be here with such great partners uh, who are on the panel today and particularly uh, our great partner, the Division on Civil Rights, uh, which is the state agency that operates through our Fair Housing Assistance Program. This is indeed a time of great challenges from the fair housing perspective. All you have to do these days is turn on the news to hear about racial justice issues. Um, the uh, recent trial involving 
uh, racial justice and policing, and there are more and more issues relating to racial justice on a daily basis in the news, highlight the issues that have long been in existence um, in housing. And in fact, a lot of these racial justice issues are intertwined with and likely caused by the long term segregation in housing that exists in our communities. The Fair Housing Act is uh, 53 years old this year. It's a young act compared to the law against discrimination. Um, and it's also a powerful act that hasn't always been used to its full potential. And I can tell you that um, in this administration, the Biden administration, we will be using the Fair Housing Act to its full potential. Um, one of the key initiatives of the Biden administration will be addressing systemic racial injustice that has occurred in the housing and credit market. And you will see that our, ac our activities will be directed in those areas. Uh, you have already seen HUD announce the initial steps in rulemaking associated with uh, building back better. One thing it's important to know is that when you're building uh, on strong civil rights issues, sometimes you have to go back and fix some of the foundational issues. And we are definitely doing that as we look again at the issues of disparate impact and affirmatively furthering fair housing um, this year. Uh, in fact, one of the first things President Biden did was direct Secretary Marsha Fudge to take a look at the rule makings on disparate impact and affirmatively furthering fair housing that had been done in the last administration and make sure that these two tools are available and strong and appropriate for use under the Fair Housing Act so that we can ensure racial equity and equity in underserved communities across the United States for various underserved populations. COVID-19 is also an issue that has brought a lot of inequities to the forefront. If you think of COVID-19 and who's been impacted the most by it in terms of severe illness, hospitalization and death, Unfortunately, it's been members of minority communities. African Americans are twice as likely to be hospitalized and die of COVID-19 as whites, Hispanics similarly, and twice as likely to be hospitalized and die of COVID-19. And Native Americans and Alaskan Natives are two and a half times more likely to be hospitalized and die from COVID-19. And COVID-19 has caused major disruptions in our economy uh, because of uh, the inability of some people to remain employed during this time period. And as we come to the end of the pandemic, we are going to see uh, significant challenges in the housing market. As we continue to deal with COVID-19, we need to address disability issues in fair housing, um, including a lot of reasonable accommodations that may be needed by people who have long-term COVID. Uh, for example, we at HUD have seen an increase in the number of complaints alleging denial of reasonable accommodations who need assistance animals to help them during the emotional uh, difficulties that people are facing associated with the COVID-19 pandemic. But there are many other types of reasonable accommodations that can also be implicated, such as um, reasonable accommodations associated with difficulties arising from hospitalization and being away from a unit, or reasonable accommodations associated with rent payments, where delays may have been caused by high healthcare costs. There are just a variety of issues we're going to see in the context of COVID and particularly long-term COVID. We also see a need for many people 
with disabilities who are currently in congregate or institutional settings to escape the, the uh, higher risks that they face in those settings when there's an infectious disease such as COVID affecting our nation. So this is really quite a time for challenges relating to racial injustice, disability aspects of COVID-19, but also I want you to remember challenges relating to sexual harassment. Um, at a time when people are facing um, income insecurity, which relates to their housing, that's the time when they are most vulnerable to sexual harassment by landlords. It's often low income women who face sexual harassment when their landlords understand that their housing is in jeopardy for financial reasons and uh, those housing providers take advantage of the situation. It's really important for housing providers to understand that sexual harassment won't be tolerated and if there is sexual harassment of one tenant by another, or for example, COVID related harassment on the basis of national origin by one tenant against another, a landlord has a duty to correct and end that harassment. And this is a, a really important topic that we are going to be dealing with as we come back from the COVID-19 um, pandemic and as the moratorium uh, on evictions and foreclosures will start coming to an end. So this is really a time for challenges. I know that we are up to the challenges. At HUD, I know we are open for business and I know our partners at the Division on Civil Rights are also open for business when it comes to receiving fair housing complaints on all these bases and many other bases that are um, going to increase in the days ahead as we deal both with inequities of face facing racial and ethnic minorities um, and challenges in discrimination facing individuals with disabilities and individuals subjected to sexual or racial or ethnic harassment. So I'd like to close my remarks at this point in time by reminding people that when you have many challenges, you have the opportunity to make great progress. And I look forward to working with our partners in um, making progress over the next year and making the Fair Housing Act the truly effective tool it was meant to be to target and end segregation and provide truly equal access to safe, affordable, and accessible housing for all Americans. Thank you. Thank you so much, Secretary Warden, for those insightful and, and inspiring remarks and for talking about all of the important work that you already ha uh, have been doing in the first 100 days and um, the fantastic work that you have planned uh, going forward. I guess the, the one question, if you um, if you have another minute, is you mentioned the affirmatively, affirmatively furthering fair housing and disparate impact rules that you are working on. For those who are less familiar, could you um, just say, just tell the uh, attendees just a little bit more about what each of those are, because I think those are both critically important. They, they are, I'm certainly willing to speak on those issues. I'm going to tell you right off the bat that I'm limited in what I can say, but I can tell you a little bit. So um, uh, the disparate impact standard uh, was um, put in place through a uh, it's, it's long been in um, case law uh, interpreting the Fair Housing Act. And back during the Obama administration, HUD issued a rule codifying uh, the standard for how it is that uh, discriminatory effects or disparate impact case is brought. 
So um, late in the last administration, uh, that uh, rule was substantially amended, weakening its ability to provide relief for um, claims involving neutral policies that have a discriminatory effect on the basis of race, color, national origin, religion, disability, or any other protected class under the Fair Housing Act. What I can tell you is that um, HUD has submitted to the Office of Management and Budget for review, uh, notice a proposed rulemaking relating to the disparate impact rule. I can't tell you what it says, except to tell you the title which says uh, that HUD plans to restore disparate impact. So the second thing is um, AFFH. Again, I can't tell you a lot about the affirmatively furthering fair housing rule, except that in the Obama administration, there was a rule put in place where grantees of HUD funds were required to do assessments of fair housing and set goals to overcome segregation and disparities in access to opportunity in their community. During the last administration, that rule was significantly weakened, uh, dare I say gutted, so that it didn't, um, uh, it, it no longer provides the, the types of um, requirements for advancement in fair housing that go beyond mere uh, prohibitions of discrimination. And again, all I could tell you is the title, but we are uh, proposing to do an interim final rule that would uh, restore the statutory definitions of AFFH and the certifications, which are statements that grantees must sign, indicating their intention to comply with the obligation to affirmatively further fair housing. I hope that answers your questions, and I hope to be able to say more in the near future. I'm hopeful that we will get a quick review by the Office of Management and Budget, and then the public will see what we are proposing. That is perfect. Thank you, Secretary Warden. That is uh, exactly what I was hoping you you cover, knowing that you can't say too much about what the new proposals are, but for um, for attendees that are less familiar with, with, the, with the history of both of those critically important rules. Thank you so much for uh, for sharing that. And again, thank you so much for, for your remarks, for joining us, and for your continued partnership um, over the years and, and going forward. We're, we're delighted to, um, to get to work with you in this new role for you and, and continuing going forward. Uh, thank you very much. We look forward to working with you. Thank you. And you'll see, sorry, the, that there for, for those uh, who are seeking CLE credit, There's a, this is now our, our first question, uh, what day of the week is it today? So uh, the, the questions will, will be similarly somewhat uh, simple going forward, but they're just again for attendance. So if anyone is wondering why that is popping up at the moment, that is why. Um, okay. Um, so thank you again, Secretary Warden. Uh, before I, I, I introduce our terrific panel, I want to say just a few words about DCR and our work with community groups, advocacy organizations, and other state partners to address housing discrimination in particular. As many of you know, the law against discrimination prohibits discrimination in housing based on race, religion, national origin, gender, sexual orientation, gender identity or expression, disability, family status, source of lawful income, and other protected characteristics. And over the past year, DCR has launched three different initiatives related to fair housing as part of DCR's efforts to expand our proactive work to fulfill our statutory mission, which is to eradicate discrimination in New Jersey. So I'll, I'll mention each of those briefly just, and, and then we'd love to, to turn it over to the fantastic panel that we have coming next. First, the LAD prohibits source of lawful income discrimination, which means that housing providers cannot discriminate against someone because they are paying their rent with government subsidies or other forms of rental assistance. This protection is critically important now since it also prohibits discrimination related to New Jersey's COVID-19 emergency rental assistance program. In the fall, we announced the results of a year-long investigation into source of income discrimination in an investigation that we called Project Home. It was a combination of enforcement, prevention, and public awareness efforts 
including over 100 enforcement actions and agreements with numerous housing providers and real estate listing companies. And Alex Kwong from LSNJ will talk more about source of lawful income discrimination later on in the panel. Second, we've been working with the governor and key legislators, as well as partners like James Williams from Fair Share Housing Center on the Fair Chance in Housing Act, which is S-250 in the Senate and A-1919 in the Assembly, which is a critically important bill that recently passed the state Senate. James will talk more about the bill in his presentation coming, coming up just next, but I'll, I'll just note that this bill is designed to ensure that New Jersey remains at the forefront of fair housing protections nationwide. And S-250 will expand protections against discrimination in housing related to criminal history, prior landlord tenant court involvement, credit history, and immigration and citizenship status. We're very grateful to Senator Singleton and his Senate colleagues for recognizing the importance of these protections and passing this bill. And we look forward to working closely with Assembly sponsors Wimberly, Reynolds Jackson, and McKnight, and the Assembly leadership in getting this important measure to the governor's desk. And third, and finally, we, we worked with our partners in the Division of Law to file a Freedom of Information Act lawsuit related to Donald Trump's rollback of the affirmatively furthering fair housing rule that Assistant Secretary Warden just mentioned. We filed those FOIA requests after former President Trump falsely asserted that the presence of affordable housing in communities leads to increased crime. And we're thrilled to see that HUD is taking steps uh, to reinstate those rules, that rule and the disparate impact rule, since the AG and BCR both actively oppose the rollback of both of those rules that Assistant Secretary Warden just mentioned a second ago. The last thing I'll say is um, Tisha has been dropping a, a number of um, helpful resources in the chat, including uh, our report on sexual harassment that Assistant Secretary Warden mentioned uh, how prevalent that is and how pervasive it is. Uh, so Tisha has also dropped a number, a number of resources into the chat. We uh, issued that report after hosting listening sessions around the state uh, about uh, oh, a little more than a year ago. So with that said, I want to uh, I want to turn it over to our fantastic panel. Um, and the first up on the panel is James Williams, who is the Director of Racial Justice Policy at the Fair Share Housing Center uh, and a, a terrific fair housing leader in the state and a, and a wonderful partner for DCR. James is going to talk about, um, about S-250, as I said, and also about other issues that he and, and his colleagues at Fair Share Housing Center have seen uh, in terms of fair housing and gaps in, in fair housing law. So James, I will turn it over to you. Uh, thank you so much, Aaron. And thank you to my uh, esteemed uh, group of fellow panelists. Um, I think we're here today to, to really uh, tap into the energy of, of the 60s. And you know, in 1961, LAD passed a uh, law against discrimination here in New Jersey. Um, and in 1968, you know, the Fair Housing Act uh, was signed. Um, so there's a lot of history um, that we're that we're actually kind of tapping into today with this panel, and, and we're looking to actually move that that needle forward. Uh, yesterday, uh, myself and uh, my colleagues at Fair Share uh, Fair Share Housing Center of New Jersey and other advocates across the state, we launched a, a campaign to really get S250 across the finish line, and that campaign is entitled in the 1968 continues. Uh, the Fair Housing Act was a powerful, powerful piece of legislation, but there were components in it that, that just, that, that didn't exist uh, now, that, that uh, didn't exist then that we have now. So we see that uh, criminal background checks seems to be a pervasive issue, um, particularly when we look at uh, the African-American population uh, New Jersey, um, for all the great accomplishments um, that we have at, in the Garden State, uh, we currently rank number one in the nation for racial disparities for both, you know, for both uh, black to white, um, for youth and adults. Um, that's something that we're we're looking to to work for, uh, work against. Um, and how do we do that? So there's a lot of work that colleagues, uh, that some of my colleagues at the New Jersey Institute for Social Justice and other organizations across the state, ACLU, are looking to to, to undo on the front end of the system, but providing access to housing um, is, is, is a back end way that we can ensure people return home 
and actually have a fair chance at housing. Um, housing, employment, and services are probably considered probably the three critical pillars when you think about a returning citizen being successfully integrated back into society. Um, and housing, in, in my estimation, is the most critical. Um, that's where you lay your head. That's where you prepare for your jobs. That's where you 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 bring your family back together. Uh, individuals that have been formerly incarcerated. Um, this is a way to re reunify family. So that house just doesn't become a house; it becomes a home. Um, and that's that's where we're looking for that that holistic therapy, that holistic rehabilitation that um, that the Department of Corrections wants to happen once these individuals return home. So providing access to housing is a critical critical piece. Um, we also understand that there are other barriers um, that um, that also exist, um, and with the, um, the the careful and, and wonderful partnership from the Division of Civil Rights, um, S two fifty not only has um, a criminal background check component in it, but also covers additional pieces. Um, since the advent of, of technology, we've seen um, an expansive amount of things um, that didn't exist previously as it pertains to to housing related issues one being criminal background checks you know that's a relatively new phenomenon credit is you know a relatively new phenomenon you know source of lawful income discrimination Th these are these are things that didn't always exist um before the advent of the internet you know all you needed before was first and last month's rent you know references um and a job you know and and you could move into a home you could you could have somewhere to lay your head and now these barriers exist um, and it is our goal, um, with the help of other advocates and partners and, and amazing uh, state partners like uh, Division of Civil Rights to, to really work to minimize those barriers and, and, and our, in our estimation, completely demolish them altogether. Um, so uh, we, we want to continue the work of 1968. We want to build upon the work in 1961 that August discrimination was, uh, was enacted. And we see this as a prime opportunity to move New Jersey forward. And I'll, and I'll close with this. Um, the decision for, for Derek Kavanaugh was a, a small piece of justice, but justice belongs to every aspect of the society. It doesn't just belong to the criminal justice system and to, and to policing. It belongs to everything, education, healthcare, housing, the environment. So um, we are owed as a state, we are owed as a people, the full holistic, complete amount of justice that, that, that we can actually um, strive to attain. So this is a step towards holistic justice not just housing justice, but bringing holistic justice to society. So we're really, really eager to be here and thankful to be a part of this powerful conversation. Thank you so much, James. Uh, and thank you for your continued partnership. Um, I, I was wondering if you could also just for a mention for a minute, talk uh, a little bit about the, the, the broad set of work that the Fair Share Housing Center does um, in addition to, to the fantastic partnership with with us and and work on these on these critical bills just for again for those who uh, don't don't know about the the full scope of, of the work that absolutely so uh, thank you um, we actually do other things as well um, so um, fair share housing center in my estimation has been a historic uh, civil rights organization uh, probably one of the most preeminent ones as it pertains to housing not only in New Jersey but all across the nation. Um, New Jersey has some of the strongest uh, fair housing and affordable housing laws in the country. Um, so actually, Saturday, May the 1st, will be the 50th anniversary of, of the first Mount Laurel One decision here in the state. Um, for those of you that aren't aware, New Jersey has a very unique um, Supreme Court mandate uh, that stipulates that every municipality here in the state of New Jersey has to have affordable housing. That's a powerful, powerful mandate uh, within a state to ensure that everyone has access to affordable housing. Um, as my colleague, uh, Dr. Nelson will probably elevate later on, there's a huge, huge racial wealth gap here in the state of New Jersey. Affordable housing works to give people the platform to actually put money aside to work towards that home ownership that can lead to generational wealth. Um, so we're really, really fortunate that we've been able to have all but a few municipalities settled um, between now and 2025, New Jersey will be, will be building over 50,000 new affordable housing units here in the state. Um, that's a tremendous amount of housing, but not enough. It's absolutely not enough. We need more. Um, we need more housing. Um, we, New Jersey is an expensive state. 
So for people to have that foothold to actually step into home ownership, we need more affordable housing. Um, post COVID, we need to do better. We don't need to be the old New Jersey. We need to be the new New Jersey. Um, and affordable housing should be a part of that conversation. So we're really thankful. Um, and this is a really, really historic week. It's, it's a historic month. So once again, May 1st will be the 50 year anniversary of the first Mount Laurel One decision. Um, so we're, uh, we're, we're, we're thankful that we can tap into that historic civil rights energy um, and be a part of this panel and, and continue to move our, our, our work forward. Thank you so much, James. That, uh, that is fantastic. And the work that that Fair Share Housing Center does on, as, as I uh, said, I wanted to make sure you got the chance to talk about it because just on such a broad range of, of issues all around the state is uh, is inspiring and, and critically important. So we're very grateful to have you on the panel, to have you as a, as a longstanding partner and to continue getting the chance to work with, with you and your colleagues moving forward. Um, the, I think, James, you, you highlighted um, a, a tremendously important uh, thing about the law against discrimination, which is that it continues to evolve and, and needs to continue to evolve. So in 1945, when uh, the legislature first passed the LAD, it applied in employment, but it didn't have housing protections. Um, and there were, in the, in the 1950s, uh, housing provisions that expanded incrementally, first in prohibiting discrimination in public housing, and then prohibiting discrimination in housing secured by mortgages held by federal banks. But it wasn't, as you said, James, until 1961 that um, housing discrimination was prohibited in, in all uh, housing in New Jersey. Again, that was still uh, seven years before the, the Federal Fair Housing Act, so uh, an important step. But as you said, just a sign of how the law, while, uh, while groundbreaking, even in 1945, as, as, as we say all the time, the, the, the first state civil rights statute to go into effect or you know, anywhere in the country, it uh, did not cover all the things that, that it should have uh, at, at that time and, and still does not. So we are committed to, to making sure that it remains at the forefront, knowing that it is a, a living statute and, and needs to respond to to the changing times as, as you so well laid out, James. So, um, so thank you for, for that. And, uh, and again, thank you for your continued partnership. I wanna turn it next to Dr. Nicole Nelson, um, who is a policy analyst at the New Jersey Institute for Social Justice. Uh, and Dr. Nelson is gonna speak some about the, the history of uh, fair housing protections um, and also about some, something that you just touched on, James, about uh, affordable housing versus fair housing and, and what those are and how they sometimes uh, mix together, but sometimes uh, can be confused for each other, as well as, well as uh, gaps in the law and, and where, uh, where fair housing protect protections can be focused and expanded moving forward. So thank you so much, Dr. Nelson. Looking forward to uh, hearing from you. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. I'm getting, I'm gonna get ready to share my screen, uh, share my PowerPoint presentation. Can everyone see? All right. Yes, we can. Great. All right, so the goals of today's presentation are to define fair housing, to highlight some key events in national fair housing history, as well as New Jersey's own fair housing history, to distinguish fair housing from affordable housing, to discuss how housing discrimination persists in the present, and to frame economic justice and housing justice as part of the broader racial justice movement. So to start, what is fair housing? Fair housing means non-discrimination in the housing. It means when you view an apartment or you go out with a real estate agent and you're looking at houses, it means you can't be discriminated against. And the Federal Fair Housing Act of 1968 defines um, fair housing, the seven protected classes under the Fair Housing Act as race, color, national origin, religion, sex, disability, and familial status. And what necessitated the Federal Fair Housing Act and the broader fair housing movement 
um, was a couple of things um, largely rooted in structural discrimination, first starting with redlining and um, as well as other factors like racially restrictive covenants, which I'll touch on in a minute. And as uh, we at the Institute highlighted in our housing report, Erasing New Jersey's Red Lines, in the 1930s, the Homeowners Loan Corporation um, created maps, color-coded maps, like the one you see on the left of, es of Essex County, and assessed uh, different neighborhoods all throughout the country and assessed them as whether, assessed whether or not they were lending risks or whether they would be good areas to make um, mortgages. So they assessed these areas and the highest rating was green and those areas were usually predominantly white. Um, they had, they were um, affluent and they had um, housing stock that was new and they received the highest rating of green and the lowest rating of red, hence where the term redlining comes from, those areas were usually black neighborhoods. And once those areas were redlined, the disinvestment in those communities was cyclical. Having once been disinvested from in the 1930s, that disinvestment continued to have an impact in the 1960s and continuing into the present day. And also racially restrictive covenants were used and they were written into the deeds of homes to prevent people of color, especially black people from living in white neighborhoods. And they flourished throughout the United States, including here in the garden state, uh, well throughout the 20th century until the Supreme Court ruled in Shelley versus Kramer that these racially restrictive covenants were unenforceable. So the fair housing movement was a wing of the civil rights movement. It was nationwide. It was comprised of local and national activists and they fought to remove these aforementioned barriers that made the housing market close and they wanted to open it up so that people of all backgrounds could compete and own their own homes. And just as there were um, fights, there were struggles to remove the barriers and discrimination and segregation, education and employment and public accommodations, there were people who struggled to remove these barriers in housing, culminating in key events like the Federal Fair Housing Act of 1968 like uh, Shelley versus Kramer, as well as the founding of the United States Department of Housing and Urban Development in 1965. And as a quick aside, uh, if you note the photo on the right side of this slide, even Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. got involved with fair housing when, uh, when he notably went to Chicago in 1966. And he, one of the things he did was he marched through a white Chicago neighborhood in July 1966, and he was struck in his head with a stone. So that's him being brought to his knees in this photo on the right. And New Jersey has its own particular history of fair housing. So the law against discrimination was signed in to law in 1945 by Governor Walter Edge, and it uh, was later amended to include a fair to include housing in 1954, first in public housing, and 1961 with privately financed housing. And that 1954 amendment is significant because New Jersey um, has a very good history when it comes to fair housing, particularly when uh, William Levitt, the infamous builder who built Levittown, New York on Long Island and Levittown, Pennsylvania, um, the New Jersey Supreme Court used that 1954 amendment of the law against discrimination to say, hey, you can't segregate housing um, any publicly assisted housing accommodation. And William Levitt had been using funding from the Federal House Admi Housing Administration to build his um, developments. So Levittown, New Jersey is now known as Willingboro Township. So since they were ordered to desegregate, Willingboro Township, unlike Levittown, New York and Pennsylvania, and Levittown, Pennsylvania is now a majority black suburb where it's approximately 70% black and about 14% white in the present day. And to touch on something that came up earlier, um, some of this fair housing history may get lost um, when it comes to New Jersey because of the focus on affordable housing. To be clear, affordable housing is very, very important. Um, but just to clarify, the Mount Laurel ruling again stated that each municipality must accept their fair share of affordable housing. Um, and what happens is uh, poverty is racialized as many low income people are black and brown due to 
structural uh, racial discrimination. And New Jersey's Fair Housing Act was really an affordable housing act, right? So it, one of the key provisions reaffirmed the Mount Laurel decision where each municipality must accept their fair share of affordable housing. But fair housing means preventing discrimination in housing based on the seven protected classes and affordable housing does not mean removing discriminatory barriers to home ownership. And this uh, fairly recent case, uh, United States versus Westchester further reaffirmed um, that fair housing and affordable housing are separate. So what happened in that case was Westchester County, New York, um, it falsely submitted cert, uh, affirmatively furthering fair housing certifications um, in its consolidated plan. And it also tried to say that its greatest impediment to um, fair housing was a lack of affordable housing. So that's what it tried to say. And the judge in that decision ruled that actually affordable housing and fair housing are separate. Fair housing is comprised of the seven protected classes under the Federal Fair Housing Act and um, affirmatively furthering fair housing, they referred to HUD's guide in this, but affirmatively furthering fair housing is specifically meant to eliminate racial residential segregation. And one year later, the New Jersey public advocate, Ronald Chen in 2010, he wrote a letter to New Jersey HUD grantees making them aware of this decision and reiterating that affordable housing and fair housing are separate. And what we at the Institute found in the draft of the state of New Jersey's 2020 to 2024 analysis of impediments to fair housing was that there was that continued conflation of affordable housing with fair housing, that there were some overtures towards um, fair housing with some of the protected classes, but there wasn't enough of an emphasis on race-based housing discrimination and race-based fair housing. And that's significant because if you prevent discrimination, you can increase home ownership among communities of color, particularly Black communities. And the other interesting thing about the analysis of impediments um, to fair housing in the draft was that it did find something um, disturbing that there is a difference in the rate of um, denial for mortgages where black New Jerseyans um, based on this data were more than twice as likely to be denied mortgages than white New Jerseyans. So that was one disturbing um, finding of theirs. So uh, this raises the question, where are we now? Well, if we look at New Jersey's uh, home ownership gap, it's, it's striking right, where Black New Jerseyans um, have a home ownership gap that is more than 30 percentage points beyond, behind white New Jerseyans. And that's especially significant because inequality in home ownership is a major source of the racial wealth gap. And as we'll see in a second, the racial wealth gap in New Jersey is significantly greater than in the United States overall. As this image shows, if we look at the right side of the image in New Jersey, the median household wealth for white New Jerseyans is over $300,000, but it's um, a little over $6,000 and a little over $7,000 for Black and, and Latino New Jerseyans. But for the um, but for white Americans, their median net worth is $171,000 and uh, Black and Latino Americans median net worth is a little over $17,000 and a little over $20,000. So New Jersey has one of the starkest racial wealth gaps in the nation. And what we also see is we see these large home ownership gaps where the majority of residents in these large cities in New Jersey, which are also home to large populations of people of color, um, are majority renter cities. And these wealth disparities due to home ownership, but these wealth disparities by race and ethnicity make these already economically vulnerable populations more economically vulnerable during um, economic downturns. And if we use Newark and Milburn as a case study, Newark was more redlined than a community like Milburn, which is predominantly white. And you can see where you live determines your proximity to home ownership, um, the, the value of your home, et cetera, where Newark has a population that's 50% black and its median home values are a little under a quarter million dollars. But by comparison, Milburn is majority white and most people there are homeowners and the median value of their homes um, is a little over a million dollars. So your access to resources 
is lower if your community was redlined. And we see how housing discrimination persists in the present with Long Island Divided, which was a series from Long Island's newspaper Newsday that showed that had some disturbing findings where it saw disparate treatment um, of home buyers of color um, when they went to view homes um, on Long Island, New York, where there was disparate treatment almost half the time against black home buyers. Um, and that continued, of course, almost 40% of the time against Latino home buyers, almost 20% uh, of the time against Asian home buyers, um, truly disturbing. And we see also there's a correlation between redlining and health today, where the National Community Reinvestment Coalition found that if you lived in a red line area, you were more at risk for pre-existing conditions for COVID-19, the crisis that is ravaging this country and this world. Um, and we also see during this pandemic, these greater calls for racial justice, for um, police accountability. And we saw some degree of accountability with the Derek Chauvin trial um, for the tragic murder of George Floyd. But this pandemic and this racial justice moment we're in in this renewed age of Black Lives Matter show that we need better overall conditions for Black people. At the Institute, um, we recently released Black and Brown in New Jersey, and it shows that the median net worth of a white New Jersey individual is a little over $106,000. But for Black and Latino New Jersey residents, their median net worth for individuals, Black and Latino individuals, is $179. So where do we go from here? Um, in the Institute's housing report, New Erasing New Jersey's Red Lines, we have a couple of solutions like a lockbox fund to meaningfully reinvest in red line communities, which can operate on its own or as part of the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. We have the New Jersey Reparations Task Force bill. Uh, it's bill number on the assembly side is A711. On the Senate side, the bill number is S322. And it's currently in the legislature and we're uh, working to get some momentum around that. And we also have, we're also evaluating existing home ownership programs to assess how they benefit Black and Latino New Jerseyans. Um, so that's it for my presentation. Um, please follow the Institute on all social media. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Nelson, for uh, that fantastic presentation, illuminating the, the stark racial disparities that exist and uh, in, in housing and also in so many other uh, systems in New Jersey and around the country. And, um, and thank you also for, for your continued partnership. The Institute is uh, a, a true leader in, in the state on, on these issues and on other racial justice issues. So we're incredibly grateful to, to you and your colleagues there for all of, all of your fantastic work uh, on that. And again, looking forward to the continued partnership uh, when, whenever we uh, hear presentations from, from anyone at, at the Institute, you, you all lay out so so well the both the issues and important steps that, that we can take uh, going forward to, to try to fill some of those gaps and, and address some of those issues. So, so thank you so much. Uh, You're welcome, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to turn it over now to Renee Kubiatis, who is the executive director of the Anti-Poverty Network of New Jersey. Um, and Renee is going to talk about the Anti-Poverty Network's work and also uh, some, some gaps in, in fair housing law and possible ways to, to address them and, and other challenges that, that she and, the, and her colleagues at the Anti-Poverty Network have, have seen uh in their work and uh sorry Renee, one one second because the uh the next cle question is is popping up about who our moderator is today i'll give i'll give uh 20 seconds or so for uh for me on screen and then and then we'll we'll turn it over to you renee just so this is not not blocking your uh, no worries, yeah. and I think we need to get my present my slides up too. Great, and 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 Whitney is going to uh, help with the with the PowerPoint. Thank you so much again, Whitney, for for doing that and for for all you're doing behind the scenes to 
make this work so well. Great, I think, perfect. We can take that off the screen. Okay, and uh, Renee, I will pass it over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you to the New Jersey Division of Civil Rights for the invitation to participate in today's panel celebrating the 75th anniversary of the Law Against Discrimination. Um, thank you, Assistant Secretary Warden and my esteemed fellow panelists. I'm honored to be here with you all and hear the excellent information you're sharing. Um, next slide. Please. Thank you. Um, so, um, the Anti Poverty Network is uh, a nonprofit, but we're a statewide uh, membership organization of both individuals, very diverse individuals, and organizations. Um, and uh, before I came on board in 2016, um, there was a really amazing group of uh, diverse state leaders who were already work hard at work for over a year on um, a report that we released in 2017 called The Uncomfortable Truth, Racism, Injustice, and Poverty in New Jersey. It contained um, like 100 different policy recommendations for how our state can end structural racism and systemic poverty. Um, and I just wanted to you know, highlight a couple of things. The housing section of the report, which is one of the six chapters, contained a number of recommendations for fair and non-discriminatory practices um, so that everyone, you know, um, can have access to and, and choose where they live in our state. Um, so the first one was really aggressively enforcing existing civil rights laws. And I know that the division is doing an excellent job of that to eliminate racial exclusion, segregation and environmental injustice. And um, it also included um, a recommendation for a well-funded prioritized litigation strategy centered on challenging municipally erected or maintained barriers to fair housing and integration in our communities like exclusionary municipal zoning. Um, it also um, recommended really creatively um, maximizing the use of existing legal protections to prevent unnecessary eviction of low-income tenants, um, in part through the provision of legal counsel um, to disadvantage tenants and ev in eviction matters, um, and to make sure, again, that people have access to decent affordable housing in areas of opportunity. And certainly we've seen some expanded funding of legal services for tenants and immigrants more recently in the last few years, um, but much more is needed. Next slide, please. So I'm just gonna to touch quickly on a couple of um, pieces of legislation as well. Um, despite working, um, nearly 40% of New Jersey residents weren't able to meet basic needs all the time prior to the pandemic. Um, that's a huge, you know, a section of our entire um, residents in the state. They juggle um, on too little income between all of their basic needs, including housing, food, transportation, childcare, Medicare, transportation. Um, and so it's really inevitable with not enough income to cover their regular expenses that they will have lower credit scores and run into problems paying their bills. And, and that's the result, right? Um, and so this piece of legislation really um, prohibits um, the use of credit scores in determining whether a rental applicant is, um, is accepted for um, either an apartment by a landlord with uh, when they have a housing voucher or in an affordable property, right, um, where they're applying to. Um, so it has a, a second reading in the Senate um, and is sponsored by uh, Senator Turner on that side. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, and, um, you know, James shared um, information about uh, the fair, uh, <laughs> now I'm forgetting, S-250. It's crucial, um, Fair Chance and Housing Act, sorry. Uh, just a little <laughs> moment of lapse there. Um, and APN, you know, has supported it in partnership with James and the Fair Share Housing Center. And thank you, James, for your leadership on these issues. Returning citizens should be guaranteed the right to housing like everyone else. But I also wanted to bring up this other bill um, that kind of can go hand in hand with S-250 or 1919. Um, as I said, many of the working poor in New Jersey are housing insecure, falling behind rent on and off um, and other bills. And so not only do they have poor credit scores potentially, but they will also have like likely um, eviction filings, not actual evictions necessarily, on their court records in their county when they've gotten behind on their rent. Um, and New Jersey generally has a higher eviction rate 
um, than Milwaukee and Matthew Desim's 2016 book, Evicted, um, over 446,000 in 2016. Um, and these court records are sold to landlords by tenant screening uh, services, but they don't provide any context to whether the case was settled because the rent was paid the tenant or the tenant filed against the landlord for inhabitability of the unit or um, the eviction was dropped for other reasons. And then these, um, you know, this information is used to deny housing to many people across our state simply because of a court filing with no context and information about what happened and why it was filed. Um, so this bill would prevent the court information from becoming public for a period of time to allow tenants the ability to find other housing if they need without this discrimination. Um, having said that, one piece of preventing discrimination is to prevent evictions and keep people safe and stably housed in the first place so they don't face discrimination when searching for a new rental at some point. Um, and that's really critical right now to prevent um, you know, evictions or, you know, the looming crisis um, from the pandemic and to keep people at home and our residents safe um, and healthy, you know, during this pandemic. Next slide, please. And so despite strong enforcement of the law against discrimination in housing the last few years, um, the Project Home Initiative and other efforts, you know, our organization, even though we are a nonprofit and not a direct ser service nonprofit, still hears from housing insecure families and people across the state who are discriminated against by landlords on the basis of race, physical or mental disability or use of a housing voucher. And I know Alice Kwong is gonna talk about that next. Um, and this may increase again, as we move beyond the pandemic with the inequities that have been exacerbated and exposed in the last year or so. Um, many times the cases that we do hear about um, of discrimination are by smaller landlords who don't understand or willfully ignore the, the law against discrimination. I don't know if it should be nonprofits and community partners, housing advocates, the Division on Civil Rights, landlord groups, or all of the above in partnership, but it seems to me we need more education and communication that break through myths and stereotypes to abate discrimination in housing as well. Next slide, please. So the goals of LAD, you know, um, are really to um, make sure that people are treated with equal dignity and equal respect and have equal opportunity to the housing um, in our state. Um, the, the quotes on the screen, um, the first one on the top left is something that has guided me um, throughout my social work career for almost 20 years now um, from Aboriginal activist group in uh, Australia, a collective. And the other main quote on the screen is from an amazing late great blues artist, Solomon Burke. Um, we're all here today because we believe in assuring the dignity and worth of every human being and the right to housing, including the right to choose where you wanna live and not having that choice limited for you. We're discussing deep rooted and long standing issues today, both of discrimination and segregation, as uh, Dr. Nelson was pointing out, that really harm people every day in our state. And so no matter our race, ethnicity, religion, gender, sexual orientation, gender identity or expression, disability or other protected status, um, any one of us can get caught in the systemic issues that persist in our state. So in order to ensure discrimination is diminished as much as possible, I think it will take all of us to come together across groups of stakeholders like those of us here, you know, not only panels, but the participants, um, legislators and impacted people in a multifaceted approach, continuing to devise the laws, policies and practices that really build on the legacy of the strong protections that we're celebrating to today in the law against discrimination. And as acting secretary uh, or assistant uh, secretary warden said, with many challenges, we have the opportunity for great success. So thank you. Thank you so much, Renee. And, and thank you uh, as well to, to you for being a, um, a leader on these issues uh, with, with APN around the state um, and for being such a terrific partner for, uh, for DCR and, and for Others I know on the panel as well in these in these critical efforts, um, and and thank you for for that very illuminating presentation. Also, um, as 
as you mentioned, um, in, in terms of the, the um, prior landlord tenant action protections, which are critically uh, important, we, we agree um, in terms of, of, of those protections. And you, and you mentioned also briefly the potential overlap with, with S250 on that front, sort of attacking it from a, from a different angle. And just for, for those who are less familiar, wanted to um, mention for any attendees. And, and we can also um, drop a link to S250, um, Tisha has in, in the chat um, for those who are interested in, in reading the text, but it also um, in, in the version that, that passed the Senate, has, as I very briefly mentioned at the beginning, has, has protections related to, to prior landlord tenant uh, actions. And, and in particular about how, um, whether, and when those, uh, those prior uh, actions can be considered by, by a landlord and, and in what context and includes protections uh, related to notification, uh, et cetera, for, for, the, for the limited set of circumstances in which they, they can be uh, contributed. So, um, can be considered. So we certainly uh, thank you for for highlighting that that important issue because of the uh, overlap with so many of the other fair housing issues that that we are working on and uh, and need to continue working on. And uh, again, thank you for that fantastic presentation. Um, I will turn it over next to Alice Kwong, who is the senior supervising uh, supervisory attorney on the LSNJ statewide hotline and co-chief counsel of housing law for LSNJ Legal Services of New Jersey. Um, Alice is going to um, talk about LSNJ and its work, about the hotline and some of the issues that um, that LSNJ hears about on the hotline in terms of fair housing challenges and and then in particular about source of income discrimination as I briefly previewed earlier. So Alice, um, again, one, I sound like a, a broken record saying another <laughs> fantastic partner for DCR and a leader on, on these issues, uh, fair housing and, and otherwise around the state. We're incredibly grateful to, to have you join us today and thank you so much. Thank you very much for, those, for the kind introduction. Uh, I'm just gonna share my screen. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so again, my name is Alice Kwong. I'm currently co-chief counsel of housing law at LSNJ. I'm also I also serve as a senior supervising attorney on the LSNJ state statewide hotline, where I frequently where I provide legal advice to um, uh, low income tenants who have housing issues, who are facing eviction. Um, a lot of the tenants that I talk to are facing issues with um, their rent. So I wanna just start off my presentation with what stereotypes or myths are associated with poverty. So often when we hear about poverty or we hear about someone who hasn't paid the rent, certain um, stereotypes or myths or um, misconceptions are associated with, with poverty. Um, often your responsibility, they make bad decisions, um, they're unintelligent, they're stupid, they're lazy, they lack the failure to plan, they cause their own emergency, uh, they're guilty, they're a bad parent, uh, they're immoral, morally bankrupt, unmotivated, um, they're criminal or, or, or they're incompetent. This simply isn't true uh, for a variety of reasons. For one, it's very expensive to live in New Jersey. Um, the fair market rent for a two bedroom apartment in New Jersey, the monthly rent is $1,544. So what is considered affordable? What should someone be paying? What should someone be contributing toward their income toward housing? That a number, that figure is 30%. So for an order for a household to afford a two bedroom apartment in New Jersey, they would have to earn $5,145 a month or earn $61,762 a year. So that translates to $29.69 per hour, which far exceeds the minimum wage in New Jersey. Uh, the average renter wage in New Jersey is $19.10. So in order to afford a two bedroom 
apartment at the fair market rent, uh, a household would have to earn, work 108 hours per week um, and work in the, the equivalence of 2.7 full-time jobs. In order to afford a one bedroom rental at fair market rent, a household would have to work 88 hours per week and work 2.2 full-time jobs. Now, um, the bottom chart represents the uh, most expensive metropolitan areas uh, in New Jersey. So in, in Middlesex, Somerset, Hunters Inn, um, a household would have to earn $34.04 an hour um, to afford a two bedroom apartment. In Jersey City, the uh, wage would be $32.52. In Monmouth Ocean, $31.52. Bergen County, Passaic, $31.21. And Newark, $28.52. So as you can see, uh, this wage far exceeds um, both the minimum wage and the average, average renter wage. So what are other reasons why people uh, would fall behind in the rent? Well, staggering unemployment. Right now, the current unemployment rate in this country is 6.2%. In New Jersey, it's even higher than that. It's 7.9%. Um, medical reasons, especially with COVID, um, there's people who might fall behind in the rent due to, due to, due to a medical emergency. Someone got sick, they, they were unable to work. Unforeseen circumstances, especially in New Jersey where many um, households are, rent, are cost burdened, um, they, they live paycheck by paycheck. So one, so one emergency could lead to um, a, a financial upheaval, which would make it very difficult for someone to stay on top of their rent. Also, death in the family is another possibility, um, especially if the family member was the primary breadwinner. Um, funeral costs, these things, taken, these things should be taken into account, um, and they are contributing factors as to one, 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 why one might fall behind in the rent. Also, a uh, natural disaster, uh, maybe COVID-19. Um, unfortunately, that, uh, as we all know, has led to many of the things that, we, that, that have been discussed in the previous uh, presentations and the above reasons just stated. So what happens when rent is not paid? Unfortunately, the common recourse for landlords is to file an eviction. So um, according to the Anti-Poverty Network, uh, 160,000 eviction actions are filed every year in New Jersey. Um, evictions lead to homelessness and housing instability. Um, and the majority of eviction actions that are filed are non-payment rent actions. Um, this is based on my experience on the hotline. Um, many of the calls that I receive are due, are due to non-payment rent. When a client calls me in regards to an eviction action, Many times it is for non-payment of rent. Um, if you do just a, a search on e-courts, a review, you will see that the majority of the eviction actions are for non-payment of rent. So what protections are available for tenants during this time? Um, the state and the judiciary have recognized that the majority of eviction actions are for non-payment rent. So at this time, uh, eviction trials have been suspended. Also, there is an eviction moratorium. That's Executive Order 106. So at this time, there are no lockouts. It's called the eviction moratorium. There are exceptions, emergent circumstances. So someone, in other words, someone can seek to have an eviction trial if the landlord can demonstrate emergent circumstances. Also, a landlord could seek to have a tenant locked out in the, in the case of it, in the interest of justice. I just want to emphasize that non-payment rent does not fall under emergent circumstances or in the interest of justice. So even though there are protections for tenants at this time, it is really important for everyone here to realize that um, the rental obligation by a tenant has not been canceled. Uh, there is no rent cancellation for tenants at this time. So tenants are still obligated to pay their, to pay their rent. So even that being said, if a tenant fails to pay rent, a landlord can still file an eviction, even though we are in a pandemic. Um, as you, the, the below showcases um, the figures um, during the pandemic and during 2020. So in 2020, approximately 
78,419 evictions were filed. This was based on my review of, of e-courts, of the evictions filed uh, during the year 2020. Um, from March 2020 to present, more than 50,000 eviction complaints were filed. In the first quarter of 2021, approximately 8,472 eviction actions were filed. And by year 2022, it's anticipated that 194 filings are going to be filed. Again, I want to emphasize that the majority of these eviction actions are non-paying rent. Again, this is based on my anecdotal um, evidence. You know what I see on the what I see um, uh, you know, my, in my practice, and also um, what I, I've seen on e-courts, and also what's being reported. So, what can be done? Well, rental. This is why I'm. This is why I'm. I'm here today to talk about LAD and. And, and, uh, and rental assistance. Rental assistance is key. It's key to helping solve this crisis right now. Um, rental assistance is key to preventing homelessness. It can stop a landlord from filing an eviction action. It can help tenants get back on track and ensures housing stability. Again, eviction is the, the disruptor of housing stability. If, a, if, a, if an eviction action is filed, then rental assistance is key to getting that complaint dismissed. Having the rent due and owing is the, is the best defense a tenant can have in an eviction action. So having that rent money due and owing is so vital and so key. So why is LAD important? Well, under the law against discrimination, landlords cannot discriminate based on source of lawful income and source of lawful rental payment. So in other words, landlords can't demand rent and then fail to accept it because they don't like, like the source. Um, Unfortunately, I mean, it's always been a problem, but sadly it's been on the rise. I, many of the calls that I received on the hotline involved this, this very issue. So why is, housing why is housing discrimination bad? It hurts tenants, especially tenants of color. Um, tenants of color, um, first of all, tenants of colors, ten I'm sorry, tenants tend to be people of color. Um, they tend to have lower incomes, they tend to be more cost burden and have higher rates of unemployment. Um, this is a really staggering and daunting statistic. One in five black women experience eviction as compared to one in 15 white women experiencing eviction. Also um, to, to uh, piggy bank on some of the remarks made today, um, eviction impedes tenants housing options prospectively. So what does that mean? When an eviction action is filed against a tenant, it affects their housing choices in the future. Often landlords will lot, look at a tenant's um, uh, history to determine whether or not a tenant should be, uh, determine whether or not they should admit a tenant or not, whether they should um, approve their application. So again, with the, as um, James Williams pointed out earlier with the advent of the internet, it's really easy to see if a tenant has an eviction action filed against him or her. Um, and unfortunately, when a landlord, and from what I've seen um, based in my practice and what's been reported, um, when an eviction action is filed, um, landlords don't want to rent to that, to that tenant. That, of course, is um, extremely, extremely unfair because an eviction action does not, should not, does not mean a tenant um, is a bad tenant or even a bad person. Um, Sometimes a tenant might decide to exercise a, a legal defense and withhold rent to compel a landlord to make repairs. And because of that, uh, because of a tenant exercising their legal right, they're now prejudiced for the rest of their, rest of their life. They're, it's going to be more difficult to find housing in those areas with higher opportunity that, that's safe and, and affordable. So LAD holds the key to holding landlords accountable. It, there's zero tolerance for discrimination. So often landlords will cite, re, cite these reasons for not participating in, in or cooperating with rental assistance. They'll say something like, I've heard excuses like, oh, we don't wanna fill out all this paperwork. It's just too much. It, it, it's, it's, it's your fault anyway. Again, going back to the myths and misconceptions that I discussed earlier in my slide. Um, um, this is just not acceptable. Um, and I'm very thankful to uh, that we had that New Jersey has LAD um, and provides us protection for tenants because it's um, because it's 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 just unacceptable. 
Um, it preserves tenants' uh, defenses in court. So uh, if a landlord files an eviction action against a tenant for non-payment rent, uh, a tenant defendant can, can raise LAD as a defense in court to preserve their rights and to raise a defense that they do have the rent doing owing. My landlord's just not accepting the rent. My landlord is not mitigating damages and is just sitting on their loss. Um, it provides justice for tenants. It allows for tenants to have a defense in court, it gives a tenant a voice, and more, most importantly, prevention of homelessness. It prevents tenants from being homeless. homeless. So ode to DCR and LAD. Um, I am so thankful to the division and to LAD. Um, it, this is a vital resource uh, for low-income tenants and unrepresented persons, um, often on the, on the hotline. Um, so just to um, give some background, the hotline, we provide legal advice and counsel, so we do not provide representation. So often we will refer um, tenants, clients to the division um, to file a complaint against their landlords. Uh, we frequently refer them to the NJ Bias online portal. Um, so again, it's just a, a really useful resource and we're so, and I'm just so thankful um, that the division is there to, um, pr to um, provide outreach on the law against discrimination. Um, so many of my clients, uh, they, um, they already know about this. So this just goes to show, this is just a testament to the, to the division on their outreach. Um, as Renee pointed out earlier, knowledge is power. Um, it's not only important for tenants to know their rights, but for landlords to know that there is no tolerance for discrimination. And this type of discrimination will not be tolerated. So um, I will conclude that I am very glad for LAD. Um, <laughs> um, and I just wanna take this time to thank Everybody, thank, thank you for the division for inviting me today. Um, thank you everybody for listening to my remarks for allowing me to talk about my work at Legal Services of New Jersey. Um, and again, I am, um, here's some information on the LSNJ Law Hotline. We're open Monday to Friday. Um, our, our hours of operation are 8.30 to 5.30. Um, you can either call if you have a civil legal matter in New Jersey um, or you could apply online and the website is on the slide and it's also, I believe, on the chat. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Allison. As I said, thank you uh, to you and all of your colleagues for the fantastic work you do day in and, and day out. And, and again, for being uh, leaders on these issues and, and fantastic partners for, for all of us. Uh, both within and, and outside of, of state government. Um, I did want to, because um, ordinarily we, we're, we would save questions for the end, but, uh, but someone has asked a, a very good question that relates exactly to, to what you were just talking about, Alice. Um, so I wanted to, to uh, raise that now, which then, so the question is, how can an, an individual, uh, let me just, went to the answer section. Um, uh, how can an individual fight against discrimination when they are homeless, making it challenging to fight against landlords who will say they won't take a voucher? Um, so I think uh, this is a, a very important question and, and thank you for, for raising it. We know that that, um, that particularly when, when someone is, is homeless, there are additional barriers that, that they face. And Alice, I wanna turn it over to you in, in a second for any additional answers you have on that. But I did, as you, um, as you just mentioned, wanted to talk for a second about NJ bias, um, and and Tisha has has put in the chat already, um, but but maybe we'll we'll put again the link to to NJ bias, which is the Division on Civil Rights' new um, new way for accepting complaints from individuals who ex who experience discrimination in in housing and in employment and places of public accommodation uh, that. Um, can therefore file a complaint with us. And we also have a, a telephone number for, um, for those who prefer that method or who need that, that method um, rather than uh, filing online. So, so Tisha has it and, and can drop the, that, in, that information, uh, our toll-free number for accepting complaints, because certainly um, if someone uh, 
is homeless or is not homeless and, and is facing source of income discrimination, um, they can contact the, the Division on Civil Rights right away. And we have um, housing investigators and, and other investigators on, on other issues, but housing investigator, investigators on housing issues who uh, work with uh, to investigate any, any allegations of, of discrimination or harassment in, in housing. Um, Alice, but if you had anything else to, to add on that, um, certainly happy to, to hear that before we, we turn it over to, to Morgan Williams, who is our last speaker. You know, that's a, that's a really, I mean, that's a good question um, and a very important question to raise. Um, I mean, that, again, you know, the division has been key in, in addressing those issues. Um, I def, you know, um, I, in those type of cases, um, the law against discrimination allows for um, a tenant to file suit against the landlord under the law against discrimination. So that's one recourse. Another recourse is to contact the division and, and the division will invest, can investigate that matter and pursue um, action if, they, if discrimination is found. Now I know um, that doesn't address their, their situation immediately. Um, unfortunately, I wish I had the answer for that. Um, I really do, but I, at this time I don't. Um, but there are legal remedies if someone has, has faced some discrimination in that regard. Aaron, could I just reply very quickly too? Uh, it, sometimes right. the vouchers are also through nonprofit organizations and uh, there are a number of, not that it's as widespread as it should be, but there are a number of nonprofits around the state who are trying to work with landlords in their areas, in their city or county or whatever, um, and to really educate them more. And so sometimes that they can be a good ally if you're facing discrimination to kind of break through some of the myths and, um, you know, get that landlord to um, accept your application. Thank you, thank you, Renee. And um, and yes, that's exactly right. One of the one of the things, as, as both um, Alice and Renee have pointed out, is, is knowledge. Knowledge is critical, and, and that's one of the things that at DCR we have been focused on is is trying to make sure that um, all housing providers know that it is the law that they uh, that they cannot discriminate based on source of lawful income. And so, working with um, with state partners and with with nonprofits to make sure that. Um, that real estate providers, that other, that other housing providers, that real estate agents, all all know that this uh, that this is the law because again, it's, it's a protection in New Jersey. It does not it, it is not a, uh, a protection in the federal. It is a, a critical protection in the in the um, in the law against discrimination. And then the other thing I wanted to mention, just to Alice's point, is um, we have been working very hard at the division to. Uh, to respond very quickly to individual complaints when uh, someone raises an, an urgent need, um, like if potentially a, a, a denial of, of source of lawful income. And um, so through through calling DCR um, or or filing on, on NJ bias, um, we we can respond uh, quickly with something we have been prioritizing in our, in our work at at the division to try to make sure to address that. Um, great. Unless there is anything um, else from any of the panelists on that, I wanted to pass it on to uh, Morgan Williams, who is uh, general counsel for the National Fair Housing Alliance, um, and again, a, a leader, a, a longtime leader on um, on these fair housing issues. Um, and Morgan is going to talk about uh, the work of the National Fair Housing Alliance, some of the issues that um, that they see nationwide uh, as well. So, Morgan, we're delighted to to have you as our as our closing speaker. And then again, if there are any um, if there are any questions, any additional questions after that, we will make sure to address those as well. Thanks so much, everyone. And I'll just make a few brief remarks that really build off of what uh, <clears throat> the other panelists have, have spoken about. And um, I wanna just start by noting that um, back in 2005, um, I was uh, just starting my, my second year of, of law school at Tulane Law School when Hurricane Katrina hit, and uh, I'm a New Orleans native. And as someone who went through that experience, I can say that 
it, it changed me and every, everyone that went through it, you know, personally and professionally. And we're still sort of in the thick of the pandemic here, but you take a deep breath. Um, there are some big changes that I think we're all experiencing. And at its core, our concepts of justice and racism are changing in some fundamental ways that impact some of what is being discussed in the call today. Um, and I want to touch on three things. One, vouchers. Two, the affirmatively furthering fair housing mandate. And three, disparate impact liability. In regards to housing vouchers, there is a paradigm shift that's afoot. And it's a shift from a position of scarcity with long lines when voucher uh, wait lists open up and wait lists of thousands and thousands of families that sit stagnant to a position of universal access to those who otherwise qualify from an income standpoint. It's a shift in an understanding of housing justice that comes from, I think, a greater appreciation of justice and the need for justice, a greater appreciation of essential workers, and perhaps a changed view in some respects of poverty and the, the prejudice and stereotypes that might go along with that. But with this paradigm shift, there will also need to be expansion of protections against source of income discrimination. And the work that you all are doing in New Jersey will be valuable along with the 18 or so other states that are engaged in this work with different definitions of source of income will be valuable partners in informing the arguments that these protections are viable and needed broadly. Secondly, I want to note in regards to affirmatively furthering fair housing, it's fantastic that HUD is reviving a standard that links meaningful local planning with a racial and social justice lens with how communities are thinking about using their HUD housing funds. Um, and so that in itself as a sort of revival is fantastic. But coming out of the pandemic, we're approaching affirmatively furthering fair housing as changed people with a changed lens. And I think that that is taking place in two, in two ways. One, as jurisdictions are moving forward with their assessments of fair housing in whatever ways they're doing that with the lack of guidance that is provided under the last administration, they're doing so in a matter that is coordinated with their community health needs assessments, with an understanding of the link between social justice, racial justice, and health. And secondly, there's a greater awareness of systemic racism and wealth inequity and the need for things like reparations. And if you look at the way that folks have talked about reparations in, for example, what Asheville is doing with the examination of their use of HUD funds, a meaningful application of the AFFH framework isn't a sort of far cry from achieving those ends. And further, for local jurisdictions or others that are thinking about implementing race conscious housing programs, in order to survive the strict scrutiny that's applied to those programs, there needs to be a credible basis for pursuing those programs. And the affirmatively furthering fair housing process is the perfect information gathering process with which to establish a credible basis for such race conscious housing programs. And then third, in regards to disparate impact, obviously there's tremendous awareness coming out of the pandemic and the Black Lives Matter movement that has continued under the pandemic of systemic racism and implicit bias. And from a housing standpoint, disparate impact is the tool to dismantle the infrastructure of systemic racism and systemic bi and, and, and implicit bias. And we are entering an exciting time because it's only since 2015 that the Supreme Court ratified disparate impact under the Fair Housing Act. That was then quickly followed by an administration that was overtly hostile to civil rights protection. And now we're entering a, a time of an administration that is going to actively enforce this work. And there's tremendous potential to really challenge some of those policies that lock in the inequity that an earlier panelist spoke about in terms of the uh, old um, housing corporation redlining maps. 
I put two, and I'll close with this, <clears throat> excuse me, put two links into the chat just in regards to some of the work that we're doing, the National Fair Housing Alliance. It is a disparate impact case against Red Line, uh, Redfin Corporation, which is a real estate sales corporation, which limits its services in part based on home value. It's a policy that's neutral on its face, but when put into practice, if you look at that Essex County, New Jersey map, you can see that Redfin offers its premier, premium services in the white neighborhoods, and it denies its services in the black neighborhoods. And that is a pattern on the next link that you can see tracks the jurisdictions around the country. And is an example of the sort of infrastructure that traps the systemic racism that we have today and disparate impact is, and its aggressive use moving forward in the context of the change, I think, perspective that we have on systemic racism is, 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 is a potential powerful tool for enforcing these kinds of, against these kinds of policies moving forward. And I'll leave it there and, and turn it back over and uh, thank you all. Uh, and I see our, uh, our last question has popped up. So I will give a few seconds for, for that before we um, say thank you and and um, and see if there are any other questions that wrap up. But just want to leave a little bit of time for that to re remain on the screen. Great. Let me take that down. Thank you so much, Whitney. Um, and thank you, Morgan, for um, for those fantastic closing remarks um, and in particular high, highlighting the importance of, of disparate impact um, and, and, and for um, sharing the details about that, that really important uh, investigation. So, so thank you. Thank you for that and for, for all of the, the work that, that you all do um, at the the National Fair Housing Alliance. Um, I think we have answered um, all of the questions. Thank you again to Laura for your, for your question. And I think you've indicated that, that we did uh, answer your question. Um, and there was there was a previous question also about uh, some of the, the PowerPoints being shared and um, as, as Tisha mentioned, this program is being recorded and will be available on the New Jersey OAG YouTube channel um, within the next 24 hours. So um, thank you all again so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you to Whitney for, uh, for all of her terrific work um, in this. Thank you so much to to Tisha Leonardo Santiago, um, one of our fantastic members of of our new community relations unit here at the Division on Civil Rights and, and um, her, her colleagues there uh, and, and their leader, Dr. Denali Johnson Fennell, uh, for uh, her terrific leadership of the community relations unit and, and the work that they have done to plan and uh, execute all, all of the, uh, all of the wonderful events that we have um, you had have put on this month to celebrate the 75th anniversary of the LAD. Um, as we've said, a, a, a critically in, important uh, law. And thank you, uh, Alice, for your your ode to uh, to the LAD, um, and and also one that it, that is continuing to to evolve at, at, as it should, as, as we've discussed. So um, thank you all again. Please. Um, Please tune in for our last event, as I said, which um, Tisha also, thank you again, Tisha, has, uh, has put in the chat at 6.30 tonight, uh, again, to, to honor those, uh, those students and young people for their fantastic submissions on uh, related to, to youth bias, which are also available on our website. And again, and Tisha is putting uh, it one more time in the chat uh, and it's called an anti-bias vision for the next generation youth art competition exhibit reveal uh an award ceremony and there also be a, a conversation as well so with that i will close and again thank you so much to all of you for for joining thank you uh, to all of the panelists for their
presentations and further ongoing partnership with DCR and their leadership on these issues. We really appreciate it. Thank you guys.